Uh, so now we'll turn to the, the local example with uh, Yahya Shaukat. And uh, so uh, he'll have about uh, half an hour, roughly, and then we'll have uh, nearly an hour for discussion and, uh, and debate. I'll, I'll just continue in English and keep the flow. I, I notice no one's using the headsets. Um, uh, I thought of calling the presentation also maybe something pro provocative. It's, uh, it's sort of dangerous urbanism and the danger of, of policy. Because we usually think of hazards in, in urban areas as being physical, as being um, that a building is structurally um, unstable or it might be in a um, uh, natural disaster zone and so on. But uh, in Egypt, I feel that the policies themselves are a danger to maybe hundreds of thousands if not millions of citizens, depending on how, how the policy is used. And just as an example, th this um, piece of uh, paper on the right is a decree by uh, uh, the governor of Cairo to uh, take by force uh, a plot of land uh, by the Nile where there are more than 300 families uh, living there. and and. To me, it's the state sort of saying, "Qarar istila," yani it's istila, or or in, uh, that someone uh, takes uh, property by force is usually associated with crime, with um, uh, with thieves. So that the state uses the same uh, terminology for itself to take over land is is kind of it's questionable. One of the problems that um, I'm going to hook up with policy is, is the fact that um, Egypt is very dense where we do live. So we, we live on about five or six percent of the land. Um, you can see all the red uh, between the uh, valley and the delta, and then the blue is even higher density. So these are cities. Um, Cairo is in, in is the middle blue uh, at the top here, at the middle there, and. Um, there's a reason for that. Uh, people think it's just that we don't move to the desert, that we like uh, living there and living close by and, and not leaving uh, the traditional land. But then when you look at who controls the land, this is um, uh, a flow chart uh, that was done in a World Bank policy paper on land management in Egypt. And actually, the people that wrote uh, the policy paper uh, were pu were also uh, part of govern uh, government affiliated bodies like the um, Ministry of Housing and uh, different other bodies. So this this is an authoritative uh, flowchart, and you see on the left there is the governorates, and they control only six percent of the land, which is the old land. But when you look at the new land, you find that the head of the hierarchy is the Ministry of Defense. And it's the ministry that all other ministries and governorates, if they want to use any of that empty space, they have to go to it first, get the okay. Once they have the okay, then they have to go to the ministries of antiquities and then petroleum to check out if, if there's anything valuable there. And then by uh, default, the highest hierarchy after that is the Ministry of um, Agriculture, because we had a very big drive to go out to the desert and reclaim it uh, from the 60s and grow more land. So it gets first pick, and then after it decides the land that it doesn't want, it goes to the Ministry of Housing. Um, and then the Ministry of Housing gets it to build the so-called new cities. So we've been living this sort of paradigm of planning where new cities are the future and where everyone is supposed to go live. Um, but then when we look at that, we find that this is, this is the, the land use uh, plan done by the central ministries, not by any lo without much local government uh, involvement, and sort of cutting up uh, the empty spaces in Egypt and seeing it's actually its development value or investment value. So the green is mostly where uh, it's going to be sold to agriculture. Uh, the new cities are boxes. And then the other 
like it's for other reasons, whether mining or tourism, uh, protectorates, and so on. The, this is the the the, yeah, the the manifestation of top-down planning or high modernist planning, where we're looking at Egypt just from the top in in two dimensions and getting a, a marker and saying uh, this is where things certain things are going to happen without really thinking uh, about what's going to go there and without really um, taking in the participation of communities that either live there already or that might move there under this plan so when we look at the new cities um, we've built around 22 new cities in about 30 years and they were supposed to house by now probably six or seven million people um, when we look at the land allocated, it was just for uh, um, communities, just for uh, housing. It was 140,000 fadens. Faden is about an acre, or about 0.4 of a hectare. Um, so that that's very low overall. Like if if we're going to look at the the, the design density, it's about 100. Uh, people gross it's 100 people per fed then so 140,000 times 50 is about a few million it's, it's not a lot of people in 30 years when you consider that Egypt has grown uh, exponentially in those 30 years when we take one of the cities and look at them so that this this graph sort of shows new Cairo which is just east of Cairo and these are the income quintiles so it goes from completely poor to, to very rich and everything in between <coughs> excuse me and then this is the land allocated so you see the very rich get a bit more than their share than about 20 percent um the upper middle class get the biggest chunk of land there and then the the going but from middle up until the poorer classes uh you get you, you find the share so it's actually a lot of competition on land that is it, it makes it actually rare it's driving the price up this is how much it's gone up in the last 10 years. So um, th this is also dividing it by how the land was allocated. So at the bottom, that's the, the, the darkest gray is what it costs to actually service the land, to bring uh, infrastructure in. So in the beginning and throughout the 90s up until the early 2000s, land was being allocated to developers uh, almost at cost, more or less. Um, but then the Ministry of Housing started doing auctions uh, on the land. Uh, the first one was in 2004 that it started uh, and then it started the ball rolling in 2006. That's when a lot of um, Gulf investors came in. Uh, some people say it's because they couldn't invest in Lebanon anymore because of the war there and they were trying to look at Egypt as a place where uh, money can start going. So we've had this sort of shift where a lot of money, a lot of liquidity came in and it just inflated the housing market. So land also by default inflates uh, housing and just goes up and up. And really there's no control on the housing or land market. So it, it's, it's a free for all. Um, the last auction, which was in last February, uh, show prices, uh, saw prices go up to 4,000 pounds per meter. So when, when you look at the difference between from about 480 pounds in 2006 all the way up to about 4,000 2013. Uh, this is very telling of the exclusion that's happening. So if, if we're not necessarily talking about eviction and tenure, we're just talking about exclusion in the formal realm. So if, if you're going to, this is the land that's designed, that's planned formally where uh, people are meant to live. Um, this is another sort of uh, image that shows uh, the inequality and the darker colors are where the governorates have about a two to one ratio of housing units to, to families uh, and of course it doesn't mean that the families there necessarily own two units it also means like in the Red Sea you actually find two families per unit so it, just in the Red Sea governor, the, the ratio is actually four to one. So we have two families living in one apartment, one family having two apartments. Um, of course, the Red Sea and uh, over at the north coast, uh, the northwest, that's uh, Matruh, these are holiday homes. So out of about maybe 
20, 24 million uh, units, housing units that we have in Egypt, 30% are closed, so that's about 7.7 .7 million, and this is 2006 figures. Um, I've been able to calculate out of that, you're talking about at least a million units that are holiday homes. So uh, it, it just shows where the money is going and where investments are going. In the last 10 years, this is more from what happened in the 90s. There was a big boom of, of holiday homes in the 90s. But in the 2000s, there's more of a boom of investment near the city. And then I'm going to show you how that investment is actually moving away from the desert fringes and now also recognizing Cairo itself in the middle as uh, a, a very like fertile ground for, uh, for housing investment. Um, this map shows uh, one of the government agencies called the Informal Settlement uh, Development Fund. It was set up in 2008, supposedly with a mandate to um, find out where map unsafe areas in Egypt, uh, uh, structurally unsafe, supposedly, and then uh, work on ways to upgrade the areas. Uh, what happened was in their development policies stated that these, the, they had to make the money back. They could not use the money allocated to them to just spend it. It had to be a rotating fund, so whatever money they spent, they had to bring back. So how do you make money out of developing unsafe areas? It's in um, doing partly a land swap where uh, you evict uh, people from homes that are derelict, uh, build uh, government housing somewhere else on the fringes of the city and sell the land that's in the city that has high value, pay part of it to cover the costs of this whole resettlement, and then the rest goes to um, the coffers of the governorate and the, goes back to the ISDF. So for me, this is their 2011 report, and I've mapped out all the land that they've claim that they say is state-owned land with uh, squatters uh, living on it in unsafe housing. So that's about 120,000 um, uh, families. Um, this also goes to show that when you're going to deal with areas like this, it, it has to be dealt with in, within the framework of, of a law that I'm going to show you later on. and. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean within the law people living on state-owned land don't necessarily get compensation. So this state agency is supposed to develop these areas so that they're not um, unsafe anymore and that they become safe, but at the same time it's put 120,000 families at risk of eviction and not getting compensation. So when we go down to Cairo, um, uh, Going back to uh, people familiar with Cairo and familiar with how uh, different maps have been uh, drawn uh, of it and showing where informal areas are, informal areas are. So here I'm more concerned within the sort of the ring road, the, the heart of Cairo, and the the light green at the top, sort of going uh, north and then on the western edge. This is the amount of land that's been built on privately owned agricultural land that's been built on since 1972. So this is the same time frame that new cities have been being built to the east and west of Cairo. Um, the ones in bright yellow are um, squatters, so uh, people that have moved in, that have built self-built communities on desert land. So you have uh, Stabla Antar at the bottom, you have Manchait Nasser sort of in, in the middle, and then you have Ezbet al Haggana where some of you went uh, yesterday to the complete east. And Ezbet al Haggana really stands out is that w w why have people built there uh, on, on desert land? And then, but then when you look at it, you find that because there is um, a lot of uh, industry next to it, uh, military-owned industry, it was probably a good uh, place to live next to uh, sort of job sources uh, for people that worked in vocational uh, work. And th this was, there was sort of roots to being able to settle there uh, because people had already started settling there semi-formally um, and it just grew. Um, in the middle is mostly 20th century Cairo, where it's not really highlighted here. And then when we go back to the Nile, you find this other sort of orange. I don't know if you can see it in orange. Um, this is the historic urban core. This is Cairo up until probably the 19th century. And 
I've highlighted it because I feel that a lot of tenure there is precarious. It's not necessarily... Um, the state doesn't look at it directly as being informal. It does not, um, in any legal documents, state that it's informal. But uh, by experience and by seeing how the ISDF has worked, um, when it, when it started working someplace and started checking out the deeds and the title deeds to know who's going to get what kind of compensation, you find a lot of vague tenure, and a lot of people can't necessarily uh, claim ownership. So even though this area isn't an informal area, it was built long before there was a planning law, um, it still has very precarious tenure. And so if someone wants to move in and contest tenure for any reason, this is where you can get a lot of problems. And this, this has happened before with antiquities, uh, when they decided the building was of a certain heritage and that they uh, wanted to own it to protect it, because we also have the law that protects uh, old buildings. In a way, in the end, it means that the, the Ministry of Antiquities has to end up owning the building, so it's like a compulsory purchase order. And of course, what is paid um, as compensation isn't necessarily the market value of, uh, of the building itself. So here, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to focus on three areas that have three different types of tenure. We're going to look at a place that, is, that the state sees as uh, state-owned land uh, but of an urban, of an old historic urban core. We're going to look at a historic urban core that the state, by its own admission, says that this is private land. And the third part is um, self-built community on state-owned land that isn't necessarily it's from the 70s. So, ah, this is... Um, I think this is the one good thing that came out of the Hernando de Soto's work in uh, in Egypt in 1997, is that he was able, I think he's the first person to talk about um, the different forms of legality of tenure. Uh, so on one hand, on the left, you have people building on agricultural land, so it's privately owned land, but they changed the use. Uh, you have people that... Um, so th these are all the, the, comp the, the, the very clearly informal. Uh, you have people that built on state-owned desert land, and then you have people that built outside village boundaries. So um, this is also a bit vague because the village boundaries uh, aren't necessarily seen as planning until recently, until the last five years where village boundaries have been or are in the process of being updated. And on the other hand, we see... Um, tenure that used to be formal, or places that used to be formal, but then turned into being informal. Uh, so you have old subdivisions without a permit. So they might be within an area, an urban area within Cairo, which was considered urban and not rural, so you're allowed to build on it. But the subdivision itself of the land happened illegally. Um, you have old city core with unclear tenure, and I think in Cairo it's much bigger than 4%. This is just this is Egypt-wide, so in Cairo th this would be much bigger. Um, you'd have be city core built without permit, and this is in Cairo also a, a very big part of a lot of formal areas like Mohandesin, like Do'i, where people have added floors outside of the original plan, and they just paid fines, and, and now it's sort of formalized. Um, you have new public housing by co-ops resold informally. Because public housing is supposed to be allocated, you own it, but you're not allowed to sell it. But what happens on, is it's sold on uh, to other people at a market price, which is much higher than the subsidized price that uh, people would have got it for. Um, so this doesn't really have a uh, title. Uh, and then you have old public housing with no clear tenure status. And in Egypt, you're talking about maybe more than a million units that are like this, that were built between the 60s and 1980s. Um, so, so people have been living there maybe for even two generations. They don't necessarily keep documents. There's, um, there isn't necessarily a track of ownership. So, or maybe it's sublet. Um, so you have a lot of vagueness here that can be exploited and people can be evicted just because of it. So, um, this is one of the most controversial plans to ever hit Cairo, and it's called the Cairo 2050 plan. Uh, this was being sort of thought up in the mid-2000s, and looking at 
a sort of a, a new school of master planning for Cairo. Cairo has always been master planned in a top down way, but this also had the marriage between the top down planning and this very uh, sort of new liberal uh, look at Cairo and investing every last inch out of it. Um, so when you look at the arrows, my interpretation is that they're pushing out all the poor people and the vulnerable out of Cairo, regardless of what their tenure is, and turning it into the sort of the world class uh, city um, they believe it should be. And of course, they're pushing them out to the desert edges where the new cities where I just showed you that even then <laughs> people don't have a chance to live there because it's just too expensive. So I don't know what the thought behind it was or, or where people were going to end up uh, living. This plan is only um, possible because of a law which is law number 10 for 1990, which is called Nazal Milkaya Lil Manfal Amma, the revoking of property for public benefit. In the States it's called eminent domain, in Britain it's called compulsory purchase order. Um, different countries, democracies have used it uh, in different ways. Um, in Egypt we've got, we state the different uses it's supposed to be used for, so there are about uh, eight um, roads and, uh, and plazas, uh, water and wastewater, uh, irrigation, uh, energy projects, uh, power stations, uh, bridges uh, and so on, uh, and railways, uh, transport projects. So bridges aren't considered transport, transport is something else, so this would probably be the metro or any other form of transport. Uh, someone might think of um, and then you have uh, for planning and upgrading so it's not it's, it's a very vague sort of uh, prerequisite I don't know what for planning and upgrading is and then the last one is anything that is considered public benefit in any other law that exists so you might create a new law that says uh, uh, I don't know, uh, having uh, circuses for public benefit, so you kick out maybe a uh, hundred families and, and put in something like that. Oh, but this is this is about coming up to, to, to the last point. Um, it will be economic development zone, business parks, IT zone, economic development, public benefit. And this comes in, in in the last line, which is anything that the Prime Minister sees fit as being public benefit. So as long as there is a Prime Ministerial decree uh, that says so, uh, the state is allowed to revoke land owned privately for the so-called public benefit. Um, so 2050 is making the Corniche of uh, northeastern Cairo look like this. The towers to the bottom uh, right of the, the screen are already there. Uh, the rest haven't been built yet. Um, and to anyone that thinks that this plan has been sort of stopped or dampened after the revolution, um, it hasn't really. That's the Corniche itself. This is in the year 2000. In, in the bottom here, these are the towers being built that I showed you. In the back, this is historic urban core uh, land. And then you can see the red around them. This is the ISDF uh, singling them out for development because they're unsafe. But then you come over on this side. Uh, this is a water treatment uh, facility. And these are sort of relatively big plots that had industry on them. Uh, uh, this is a couple of towers that uh, went up for some uh, housing. And then you have this red bit here. Um, this was demolished in 2005. It's called Hekra Abu Doma. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many families uh, were uh, kicked out, but if it's comparable with Boulet, it would be uh, between 350 or 400 families. Um, and this was very controversial at the time. Uh, a lot of rights groups uh, condemned it. Um, but it went on, and this is 2012, and the land's standing empty. But then when you go on to the website of the Cairo Governorate, you find that there's a master plan there. Um, the thing is, I can't read the master plan because it's in, in very small resolution, but I can guess that uh, we're looking at economic development of the area and not necessarily public benefit. 
Ah, uh, not, uh, yani north is north is the going that way. Ah, ah. So this is this is Ramlet Bula itself. Uh, yeah, and then this is the Kabish and this is Arcadia. But it's, the red is only around this part, it's not taking it all in. Okay, they're there. Oh. Good, uh, they'll, they'll add some color. <laughs> Um, uh, since people found out since since the first piece of paper that I showed you in the beginning of the presentation came out and this was uh, the governor's decree to take over the land which is uh, this part we still don't know about these two parts but this part and this is sort of laying down the groundwork for the um, revocation of property for public benefit but then what I don't understand is if the state itself says that this is state-owned land. Why doesn't does it need to revoke the property? So why does it need to go through this legal sort of form of taking the property? And in another sense, since the revolution, a lot of uh, communities have come up in arms and saying that okay, we accept that there might be development of the area, but we want proper compensation and we want to be resettled within the area. Um, okay. Um, we've been working with the uh, with the popular community in uh, in Ramlet Bule, and we've seen government plans to rehouse them in the same area. But then you fall into legal traps because you have renters, you have people that have squatted, you have people that have very clear tenure. Are they all going to be compensated equally? Is the government going to compensate the landlords and the tenants both? Uh, or not, um, and and many other uh, sort of cracks where a lot of people can can fall through. Um, th the one thing that is is really be actually happening is that you could see a strategy for the government dealing with the area is that it it has arrested about fifty of the main sort of natural leaders. Uh, of the area in a sort of a separate case that some people think it was sort of set up to lead to that point but uh, they have lost a lot of their negotiating power because uh, these natural leaders are uh, arrested they're also being economically drained because uh, men are the main bread earners and these men are between the ages of sort of 20 and 45 and so a lot of families have not been earning much of a living for the last six months. So this we we read it as a way to sort of bring the community down to its knees. So when the government comes in to negotiate these days, it's very easy to sort of get away with a lot of things that if these 50 men were around. And we're seeing this as a pattern sort of happening in other areas. Um, and it's, it's hard not to think that this is a sort of a strategy um, to evict the area at bottom price and then sell it at top price. Um, this is the other example that we have, which is um, also a historic urban core. This is in, also in, in, the, in the district of Bulet, but this is the Maspiro, so-called Maspiro Triangle. And this is by the government's admission, privately owned land. And then you also see a red squiggly line going around a big part of it. Um, if if I were living there and I went on to the Cairo governor website and I pressed on the button that says um, investors, this is what I'll find. So I, I'm I legally I'm living there. I have tenure and all that. And the orange buildings are the buildings that they're going to keep. So they're keeping the radio and television building. They're not touching the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the hotel, the Hilton Ramses at the end. And then there's another. I think it's a public building at 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 the other end. But then everything in the middle just sort of transforms into a leisure. A hotel with a Nile walk or a water walk that goes through it. And it's all because the area looks like this. Yes, it does have structural problems, and yes, it also has a lot of problems with services. And when we asked, we found out that 
they weren't allowed to get water or electricity in for the last few years. So this is a very targeted eviction that's happening in, in, in sort of in silence. So if it's not necessarily going and pulling people out of their homes, but just short of um, draining the, the place. And it's actually, if you look at density maps of the area over the last 20 years, it has been depopulating. And it's for this reason. There was also a governor decree um, for buildings not to be rebuilt if they fall and banning uh, restoring buildings if, if they're in bad shape. So, so, I mean, this all leads to it becoming even more derelict and looking like this and making people even more vulnerable. So you talk about the threat of eviction keeps a place from being developed. This is what's happening even though they own it. And this is what it's supposed to look like. Um, this is my last example, and this is uh, Stabla Antar and Esbet Khairallah, which is a little promontory uh, of desert land uh, to the south of Cairo. Um, people have populated the area probably also over the last 30 years, and because it was very undesirable land and no one wanted to go live there, so they've actually built homes and they've managed to make a living until the ring road came. Um, so here we see a six-lane highway as it's being cut through the community for about a length of four kilometers. And I'm not sure, I didn't, at the time I was in college, I was in Cairo University uh, while this was being, uh, this was happening, and we were being taught that you could use, um, or it's your right as an architect uh, to use the law that allows you to revoke um, land for public benefit. When you look at the ring road, and let's say we argue that it is public benefit, you don't see any access ramps from that community. So the community itself that gave up the land, and I probably can assure you, not for very good compensation or any anywhere near fair compensation, aren't, aren't able to use uh, this highway. This is after the highway went through so so here we see the sort of the width of of how big the project was and this was just one community uh, that was contiguous so here what I'm talking about is also um, the fantastical uh, sort of plans in the Cairo 2050 of Khufu Avenue, of Sa'ara Avenue, of the Matareya Avenue, of just this sort of idea that you can open up these big streets in highly populated areas, there is precedent for it. So it is possible. On a maybe more pragmatic level, we have at least two uh, major uh, roads that are going to be built uh, to link Cairo to uh, the desert highway to the west, which is the continuation of Saft al uh, axis and the Rod al-Farag axis. And they're going to, to, to go also through a lot of other communities. So this is also where we need to question this idea of public benefit, especially that one of them, I think, is going to be a public-private partnership. F th this is also where entering other new territories where the private sector is going to be part and parcel of uh, this sort of um, activity, if you will. And um, I think I'm, I'm not going to necessarily talk about any recommendations. I think peop most of you probably understand what the recommendation is without it being spelled out. Thank you. Thank you, Yahya. Um, in, in some important ways, you validated uh, Gautam's prediction of large-scale evictions to come. And uh, within a plan, uh, within uh, a context of uh, ambiguous and vague tenure, maybe some questions will come to you about some of those categories. Uh, but also within a state that, although you mentioned that state land is Aradi Shab. This actually contradicts the official concept of state land, which is not uh, land of the people, but land that is subject to rather uh, law-enshrined arbitrary uh, measures and, and decisions for what becomes public purpose and, what, uh, and, and for the service of which publics, uh, including external ones. Um, as opposed to those who are living there. Uh, 